Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our presentation, Theological Writing and the Power of Place. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. A diasporic Puerto Rican by way of East Harlem in New York City, professor of theology and Latinx studies, Benjamin Valentin, joined the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry in the summer of 2020 after four years at Yale Divinity School where he was an associate professor of Latinx Christianity. While at Yale, he served as one of the founding architects of a concentrated master's degree program in US Latino, Latina, and Latin American Christianity, and as the first Latino to be part of the full-time faculty at Yale Divinity School. Prior to that, Professor Valentin spent 15 years on the faculty of Andover Newton Theological School, where he was professor of theology and culture and founding director of the Orlando y Costas lecture, Lectureship in Latino, Latina, Religion and Theology. He received a BA from the College of New Rochelle, an MTS from Harvard Divinity School, and earned a PhD from Drew University. An interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary scholar, Dr. Valentin's work spans across and draws from such fields and frameworks as the history of religion, critical theology, Latino studies, Puerto Rican studies, social and political theory, critical place inquiry, and the discourse of decolonization. He has a long-standing involvement in the Hispanic Theological Initiative Consortium, a doctoral level mentoring and scholarship program. He serves on the executive board of the American Theological Society. Dr. Valentin is the author and editor of seven books to date, including the award-winning Mapping Public Theology Beyond Culture, Identity, and Difference. His more recent scholarship explores and highlights the multidimensional significance of place and works towards a theology of place. He recently completed a manuscript projected to be released in late 2023 that explores the intersections of liberation theology and critical place inquiry while putting forth a new model of place writing within theology. We are delighted to have him as part of the faculty of the STM and especially delighted to have him with us tonight and to hear more about his scholarship. Please welcome Dr. Valentin. Good evening, everyone. Oh, this looks beautiful. You guys did it up. <laughs> And uh, let me get myself set very quickly here, just a minute. But certainly, uh, uh, thank you, Dean McCarthy, for that um, kind and generous um, introduction. And uh, a good evening to each and every one of you. Um, and here at the start, I want to quickly, of course, say thank to um, Megan and, and Cara and the whole team of the Continuing Education uh, the whole continuing education team here at STM for this invitation. Um, I thank each and every one of you, of course, for taking time in your busy day um, and schedules uh, to be here this evening, whether in person or remotely. Uh, I, I heard that uh, 126 people had registered um, to, to join us um, remotely, and so we welcome them as well. And before beginning, I want to say a special thank you to my brother Eli, and uh, to his wife and life partner, Maria, and to my beautiful nephews, Justin, Gabe, and Benj, uh, who made the trip all the way from New Rochelle uh, just to be here this evening with us uh, in a show of support for the STM, continuing education, and for me. As some of you know, it has been an extremely difficult and challenging year for us as a family. And we have rallied in support of each other in all sorts of ways, including this, this one. And so I'm thankful for that and thankful for their presence here uh, and in my life. So I'll say thank you 
Thank you, thank you. Now, before beginning my lecture, I'd like to make note of something. In recent time, I've begun to experiment. Now I can begin this, this uh, I want to time myself here. <laughs> now I can begin it officially. Um, I, I'd like to make note of something, and it's that in recent time, I've begun to experiment with a different voice and style of writing in my writing. I have decided to make use of the opportunity of this lecture to continue practicing with that voice. So instead of the usual, I'm going to call it academic-y, um, jargon-filled, abstract, theory-laden, and name-dropping rhetorical style that you might encounter in one of these lectures, I am going to speak from the place of experience and, and of self-reflection. Uh, employing an autobiographical style at times in the lecture. Right. So fittingly, perhaps, I want to begin with a memory. I must admit that more than 20 years later now, I still remember the question as if it were asked yesterday. And I, and I mean that. I truly mean that. It went like this. Ben, in the rest of our time together, we will ex surely explore deeper and more interesting questions regarding content, thought process, sources, methodology, and the like. But I am curious, can you tell us where exactly was this work born? Where exactly was this work born? The question was the first one asked at my doctoral dissertation's defense many years ago, many years ago, at Drew University. And it was asked by the late Ada Maria Isasi Diaz, a well-known ethicist, theologian, and activist who is renowned for being the original architect of Mujerista theology, a particular form of US Latina feminist theology. Now here, at the start of this lecture, I would like for you to imagine that you had been asked that question. In my case, because I'm an academic, the work under consideration was an academic piece of writing. In your case, the body of work could be a class paper, a sermon, a lesson plan, a committee report, a musical composition, a song, a poem, a news article, even a social media post. And we could even speak more broadly of a particular way of thinking here, or a practice, or regular tendency, behavior, attitude, or way of doing things. It could be any handiwork, or common activity, really. All the same, the question delves into the sources of inspiration that influence us. I'm thinking especially of our thoughts, our knowledge claims, our beliefs about the world, our creations. What inspires them? What informs them? What motivates them? What guides and sustains them? Keep those questions in mind, and if not, I'm going to come back to them at the end. Well, if you're anything like me, it's likely that your first thought in response to the question will go towards an influential thinker, that's what I did, an author or text, an influential course or class taken, an influential experience or event in your life, an influential community or group of people. The influence of family might come to mind, or that of a song or a poem even. It isn't as likely however, that we would think of a place as the motivational or psychological impetus of our thoughts, beliefs, and knowledge claims and productions. If truth be told, it isn't often that we stop to think about the ways in which particular places and, and our experiences in and with them inform and give shape to our understandings of thought and belief, and therefore, to our intellectual projects and compositions. What do I mean when I speak of places? By places, I am referring to the different 
physical spaces and locations that we invest with meaning. I mean the actual physical, geographical places that register in our memories and to which we have emotional and practical commitments, even if subconsciously or unperceptively at times. I'm talking about the regions, towns, villages, cities, city blocks, neighborhoods, buildings, homes, natural environments, and all of the other kinds of possible material settings within which we conduct our lives and produce and consume meaning. These meaningful material locales that we call places aren't neutral, static back backdrops to human life. They influence and shape life. They affect and mold human thought, experience, memory, identity, and activity. They often even affect the opportunities we are afforded or denied in social life. In fact, every aspect of our personal and social lives is touched, influenced, and shaped by the particular geographical places in which we live and move and have our being. And this is why we should get into the habit of counting them among the influences on our understandings of thought, knowledge, and belief, but also on the contours of every other aspect of our lives. But we have to admit that, with a few rare exceptions, most of us aren't wired or prepared to think of places in this way in these parts of the Western world. Despite their influence, importance, and, and impact, places are still likely to be ignored or overlooked when it comes to registering or registering of the factors that give shape not only to the character of our, co of our cognitive processes and creations, but to the character of our lives in their entirety. You can understand then how as a budding academic theologian, I could be taken aback by and even confused by that opening question at my doctoral dissertation defense many years ago. The truth is that I misunderstood and mishandled the question. Thank goodness it didn't cost me the PhD degree. <laughs> Thinking that she was asking me about the intellectual human sources of inspiration that had influenced me, I proceeded to rough out a lengthy genealogy of ideas derived from courses taken and books read. In fact, it was only some, only some weeks after the defense in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with her that I came to realize that there actually was a geographic where in Isasi Diaz's question. She really was asking me about the neighborhood I had called my home place for much of my life and how it played into all that I said in and through the pages of my dissertation. In short, the question had been where my work was born, not how it had been born. There's a difference. Isasi Diaz knew that I was born and raised in a neighborhood of New York City known as East Harlem or Spanish Harlem or El Barrio, which was home to one of the first and for a long stretch of many decades the largest Puerto Rican community in the continental United States. Not only that, but after having lived for various years in other locales in the Northeast, I had returned to live in this neighborhood for the final two years of my doctoral program during which I wrote my dissertation. Isasi Diaz was curious and wanted to know if East Harlem, if Spanish Harlem, had played any part in it. Though she didn't use these terms, the question she posed to me the afternoon of my dissertation's defense was the question of place. More precisely, it was a question about the importance and influence of places. For almost two decades, I've reflected long and hard on this complicated question. She's not around to hear the response to it anymore. But I think somewhere in the heavens, <laughs> she continues to, to hear me try to answer her question. 
And I've come increasingly to realize its salience and centrality in a relation of, to a whole host of other topics, issues, and concerns. Among the outcomes of this reflective pro process lies a newfound understanding and appreciation for the relationship that exists between place and epistemology. And perhaps more deeply and importantly for me, a better understanding of the true provenance of my own thinking and writing. Although it was the cause of a stressful moment at the time, and yes, it was stressful, it was stressful, I can say this today. Thank goodness for the nudge of that defense question. For as a result of it, I discovered the placed origin of my thinking. I have become more aware of how indebted my thinking and my writing are to Spanish Harlem, my home. I can see in them vital connections between the region of my upbringing and my thinking and writing. Vital connections to which I had paid little attention previously. Connections that I had underestimated and underappreciated. This realization has awakened me to the ways in which place contributes to critical knowledge. And to keep in view how it is out of my interactions with place, specifically Spanish Harlem, that I construct my knowledge, beliefs, and ways of thinking. In other words, I've learned to include places among the epistemic locations that persons bring to their knowledge claims. Gracias, Ada Maria. Gracias for a gift that gives ungiving. <laughs> now, there are various themes, emphases, and traits from my own written work that she picked up on early on that I could use here to show Spanish Harlem's effects on my, on my thinking and writing. But I'm going to limit myself there's J-Lo <laughs> and Mark Anthony. <laughs> she belongs to the Bronx, but we're going to claim her nonetheless. <laughs> He's one of our own. <laughs> but I am going to limit myself to one that has been visible in my work from the very beginning and that is clearly traceable to my place beginnings. Traceable, that is, to Spanish Harlem and to my experience, experiences in and with it. Namely, a critical justice orientation that stays focused on matters of economic inequality. A critical social justice orientation that stays focused on matters of economic inequality. This could be seen all through the trajectory of my written works thus far. I believe this to be the most obvious example of Spanish Harlem's influence on the character of my thinking and writing. And I offer it here merely as an example from my own life that serves to highlight the influence that places can have on our understandings of thought and belief, sometimes without our even realizing it. That is precisely the story here, or at least the one I want to highlight. I'm going to share as snip snippets of my personal history only to turn the spotlight on the space of negotiation between human subjectivity and the physical places we inhabit. In other words, my life story isn't the story here. The story here pertains to the marvelous power of place. I specifically have in mind the epistemic power of place. When I reflect on my written works, it is clear that issues of social justice have always been of prime importance to me. Indeed, the pieces of writing I have been able to produce thus far have managed to relate its subject matter to the question of social equality one way or another. I found a way to fit it in there one way or another. Whether I was asked for it or not, it's made its way in there. And I've tried to be comprehensive and inclusive in my deliberation. But for all that, it should be obvious that matters relating to economic injustice and material inequality have a special place in my heart. Actually, I've spent the better part of my career urging fellow members of the US liberationist and progressive camps in theology and in religious studies to pay closer attention to the economic dimension of justice, encouraging them to devote particular attention to injustices of political economy. My aspiration throughout the whole of my academic career has involved the merging of two dimensions and conceptions of justice, the cultural and the socioeconomic. 
And this because the reality is that many people in our communities and society continue to suffer injustices that are traceable to both political economy and to culture simultaneously. Hence, my hope has been to promote the construction of theologies that can tie together the problematics of recognition and redistribution, adopting in this way the cause of a more comprehensive emancipatory project for justice. That has been my work in liberation theology. But where does the impetus for this broader emancipatory poli political vision come from? What is the origin of this critical social justice orientation that stays focused on matters of economic inequality? And why has it been so important to me that the forces that confine people in the quagmire of economic and material inequality not be forgotten, nor that the particular perils of economic hardship be ignored? The answer lies within Spanish Harlem, really. The attentiveness and focus being discussed arises out of the unparalleled education that I receive from and within Spanish Harlem on the social and economic consequences of excessive privilege and on the disadvantage of economic hardship. And do note my use of language that confers agency on Spanish Harlem's behalf. It is because I want to emphasize the active role that it played in this whole affair. In fact, practically everything inside of it played a role in shaping my insight into the actuality and perils of economic inequality. The material configuration, location, and ethos of Spanish Harlem, including its preponderant architecture and building design or housing stock, its visible grittiness, its social demographic characteristics, its traffic patterns even, its geographic setting within Manhattan and next door to Yorkville in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, even the struggles and diligence of its residents and the reputation it wrestled with as a district, all of this worked together to leave a mark on my psyche and to brief me on the subject of America's undeniable class divide. I would venture to say that the knowledge and insight conveyed by Spanish Harlem's physical environment and borders is one that neither a text nor a chart can ever match. As a matter of fact, the teaching it provided me on the reality of inequality came prior to any book learning. I could acquire notions of economic fairness and market economy. Long before I got the opportunity to read from and about Karl Marx, Engels, Max Weber, you know them, Jane Jacobs, John Rawls, Michael Harrington, William Julius Wilson, Nancy Denton, et cetera, et cetera. During, mostly during my middle and late college years, before that, Spanish Harlem had already taught me much about the real life consequences of economic disparity in a country often known for its excess. And the exact location where much of this learning took place was on 97th Street in Park Ave. I still remember it well. There, in full view, for everyone to see, prevails a real-life physical portrait of the divergent fortunes of the rich and the poor or near poor. A brief look in two directions at that very spot is all that is needed to understand, and you're going to see it sh shortly, that gross inequality exists in the United States. And it is all that is needed to comprehend that it leads to consequences in virtually every dimension of everyday life. Look one way, this way, in a southerly direction, and you will see those elegant, camped, well-maintained streets that Park Avenue is generally renowned for. Trash is hardly seen in that direction. There is also the manicured white boulevard line lined with trees and greenery year-round. Tulips and cherry trees in the spring, begonias in the summer, hawthorn trees ablaze with red buds in the fall, and lighted fir trees in the winter. It so happens that there is a New York City nonprofit organization called the Fund for Park Avenue, which is responsible for planting and maintaining the trees and flowers on those Park Avenue streets. Although it is worth noting that it accepts the responsibility only for the south side streets of Park Avenue between 54th and 86th streets. 
the New York City Parks Department pitches in and expands the landscape gardening and groundskeeping up to 96th Street. Perish the thought that the streets north of 96th Street and all through Spanish Harlem be accorded the privilege and benefit of such beautification. But it looks good in those southerly Park Avenue streets, no doubt. It makes for an attractive scene in that direction, an eye-pleasing view without a doubt. No mean feat at that, too, particularly in an overall gritty New York City. Helping, too, are all of those door-person attended luxury apartment houses on both sides of the avenue from 47th Street to 96th Street. Even from the distance of a city block or two, when one is standing on 97th Street, it is plain as day that those houses are well maintained and therefore in pretty good shape. And it is easy to see that they afford their occupants elegant and generous living space on top of the comfort, security, and luxurious look and feel that they permit. And it is rather interesting, too, that the streets to the south remain relatively quiet with respect to noise of traffic. Strangely enough, right, in such a big city. Even cab drivers and regular motorists seem willing to hold back from hunkering their horns. A short two or three block walk in a southerly direction from 97th Street reveals why this is so. It turns out that the city administration has road signs posted that threaten to impose a fine on any motorist that dares to disturb the peace on those streets of Park Ave. I never saw one of those north of 97th Street, however. I still don't. I guess the peace of, res of the residents of Spanish Harlem and Harlem isn't as precious or as important or valued. I would like to point out too that the streets to the south of 97th Street are well lit and the wider boulevard and more open sight lines existing in that direction combine with the further brightness to engender a greater sense of safety from that side. The neighborhoods to the south also reap the visual and status benefits conferred by such iconic structures as the MetLife Building, the Helmsley Building, the Waldorf Astoria and the Grand Central Terminal, and also by the many glass box skyscrapers that serve as headquarters for corporations all through. All told, it is pretty much a picture of plushness, comfortability, security, and location-based privilege that one sees in that location. And I haven't talked about some of the other registers of, that have to do with wealth. Now, one might consider life in that direction to be a matter of good fortune, perhaps even a blessing. On that account, it is nothing to be ashamed of and nothing to be troubled by. The problem is that things in the other direction to the north don't feel, look, nor sound the same. And the sight of the great divergence, as well as the thought of its likely consequence, for present and future life disturbed somewhat. This is when it is reasonable for one to want to stop and consider the reason for the troubling feeling in one's soul. I used to stop by 97th Street and Park Avenue pretty regularly. Often after school when I was growing up and all through the years that I lived in Spanish Harlem. It was only three blocks and two avenues away from my home, after all. As Morpheus explained to Neo in the movie The Matrix, I think it was because I knew something. <laughs> what I knew, I couldn't explain in words at first. But I felt it and experienced or witnessed it there in that specific location, that there's something wrong with the world. And that the transgression has something to do with structured social inequality. It was there like a splinter in my mind driving me mad. And it was this feeling or intuition that brought me to 97th Street and Park Ave over and over again to look in one direction, south, and then in the other, north. I have to admit that often when looking at the neighborhood or the neighborhoods to the south, the basic sentiment conveyed by James Baldwin's question would cross my mind even before I was able to encounter it on later on in life. And why isn't it for you? I asked the question because my neighborhood in Spanish Harlem seen to the north at 97th Street and Park Ave looked very different from the one bordering it to the south. It was and continues to be a neighborhood rich in history and cultural treasures with a caring and a close-knit community, a likable, proud, and historic district without a doubt 
but Spanish Harlem looks very different from the more affluent and ritzy neighborhood bordering it to the south. Yorkville, that is. And one could tell just on the basis of sight and sound that the difference carried consequence for most aspects of everyday life. There are the omnipresent, old and poorly maintained tenement houses all through the neighborhood. And the many public housing projects as well. There's the unsightly, massive granite and steel viaduct that serves as the foundation for the elevated railway tracks of the Metro North Line, a viaduct that cuts right through Spanish Harlem, starting on 97th Street and Park Ave. There is clearly less street light on the side of Spanish Harlem. Trash is more noticeably, certainly. The manicured wide boulevard lined with trees and greenery does not exist over here, folk. Go take a look. <laughs> replaced by that ugly stone and steel viaduct and the single lane traffic pattern that it imposes on the avenue in each direction from 97th Street until one encounters the FDR Drive and the Harlem River at 132nd Street. There is no nonprofit organization like the Fund for Park Ave to beautify the streets of the residents of Spanish Harlem. There are none of those road signs, road signs threatening to impose a fine on impatient motorists. So it is no wonder that hearing the sounds of vehicle horns and sirens blaring in this direction is much more prevalent. A higher asthma rate has even been reported for the district. Man look it up, Manhattan Community District 11. Who knows, perhaps it has something to do with the traffic patterns imposed on it and the less than efficient old tenements and projects that cover it. Though one also has to consider the potential health drawbacks of extended living and poorly maintained densely inhabited and frequently rat, mice, and roach-infested buildings. Oh, and by the way, there are no iconic status and property value-raising structures this way. However, Spanish Harlem's residents can count, count on a higher degree of exposure to violence, gangs, and toxic air, all while also having to get by without the limousines and chauffeured luxury vehicles you see south of 97th Street and Park Ave. Public transportation will have to do for them with the occasional taxi ride, Though the yellow taxis, by the way, have been known to avoid our part of town. That's why we now have the green taxis. It's the yellow ones that didn't want to come our way. <laughs> Do you remember still? I remember ordering sometimes. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take a little moment here. Just mine as well, right? I'm breaking, I'm breaking every other rule in <laughs> academia. But uh, I remember in our church, we used to order pizza every once in a while when we had events in my father's church that he, that he pastored for 54 years. And, um, and we used to order pizza, and they used to deliver to 96th Street. So we would have to walk four blocks to grab our pizza because they didn't want to make it past 97th Street. So they would say, 96th Street is as far as we go. Right? All things considered, then, it is a recognizably different and unbalanced lifestyle we are talking about here when we compare the two areas and social settings bordering 97th Street and Park Ave. All right. Now, there is something else, I think, that we are likely to intuit when looking in two directions, to the south and then to the north. It is that the residential and lifestyle divergence we are taking note of in this social setting has been put in place, but I don't mean by God even though we believe he's all-powerful, she's all-powerful, it's all-powerful. But one understands deep down inside that the visible situational differences neither drop from the sky pre-designed nor emerge suddenly, randomly, or without method here on Earth. It registers somewhere deep down that they are the result of political, economic, and social forces and processes, the result of decisions and actions taken and not taken, by individuals, agencies, and institutions of society over many years. One might imagine the list of main determinants and underlying drivers being long. And well, one wouldn't be wrong. Federal and local government leaders, agencies and policies, business executives and financial firms, real estate investors, developers and speculators, corporate and commercial investors, private investors and organizations, urban planners, even the cultural power of consumer tastes and collective patterns of, of racial stigmatization and discrimination, all of these constituents 
parties and entities have played a role in producing the topography of privilege and privation, the topography of inequality that we can see, hear, and feel at 97th Street and Park Ave. Time doesn't allow for my explanation and analysis of these and other factors here today. For now, it will suffice to say that the placial, I call it the placial divergence, evidence on 97th Street and Park Ave didn't happen by accident. That inequitable formation resulted from an intricate and pernicious conflation of race, politics, and privilege and opportunism. To this, we can add a dash of callousness, indifference, denial, gullibility, and misplaced blaming of the victims of poverty on the part of the American public, leading to a collective irresponsibility in tolerating levels of inequality that should be unacceptable. Simply put, it is quite the toxic brew that produced the state of things as they exist on 97th Street, this suggests. And there's no doubt that many ingredients, factors, and processes in this case are involved. One can even get an indication or inkling of the complexity of the situation right there in place. It shouldn't be too difficult for an observer to see, for instance, that complexions in Yorkville, immediately south of 97th Street, become considerably wider. They are noticeably bro darker, browner, or more tan, trigueñito in Spanish Harlem. This alone should be enough to remind, remind one of what social theorists call the intersectionality of race and class. In other words, it's a complicated, many facetedness mess, for sure. But deep down, one understands that money has much to do with it. One understands that money has been and continues to be a key factor in the creation of this place-based inequality. Exploitation of people's labor for the benefit of others. Working class jobs with stagnant wages, insufficient or no retirement funds, and inadequate health insurance. The loss of blue collar jobs due to automation, outsourcing, and the economic interests of big businesses. Government's general indifference to the loss of those blue collar jobs and government's unwillingness to regulate the economic behavior of individuals and firms in the private sector. Cutbacks in programs to protect low-income families and individuals from poverty and hardship. Incomes that have continued growing more unequal to this day, and a vast difference in the way that the lives and the communities of the rich and those of the poor or near poor are regarded and served by municipalities, urban planners, architects, businesses, community organizations, and investors. These are among the money matters that have mattered very much in generating the geographic disparity being considered. Now, I know that similar regional disparities can be seen elsewhere in the United States and around the world. But there is something particularly notable to my having seen it and experienced it in the middle of Manhattan in New York City, I believe. After all, among other things, New York City is often referred to as the financial capital of the world. On reasonable grounds, too. As a matter of fact, if the New York metropolitan area were a sovereign state in itself, it would have the eighth largest economy in the world, producing an estimated gross metropolitan product of $2 trillion. New York City is also home to the highest number of billionaires of any city in the world. It should be noted, however, that it is the borough of Manhattan specifically that carries a claim to fame with respect to financial means, understandably as well, seen as it is anchored by Wall Street in the financial district of Lower Manhattan and because it serves as home to the world's two largest stock exchanges by total market capitalization, the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. What's more, as luck would have it, Yorkville in particular has been where Wall Street big shots Celebrities and billionaire heirs love to mingle and reside. This placed them right next door to my neighborhood in Spanish Harlem, immediately to the south of that imaginary but tangible boundary line I've been talking about on 97th Street. So it's no wonder that Manhattan has been referred to as money-making Manhattan by some. But not everyone was making or coming into money in Manhattan, obviously. And this includes virtually everyone in my old neighborhood of El Barrio in Spanish Harlem. Now, I can't get into any depth and detail 
to some of the factors that I'm going to talk about now in closing. But here, nearing my conclusion, I want at least to mention a couple of lear learnings or lessons that I receive from, from this. Among the lessons the sight of that place-based inequality gave to me was the understanding where, that we really are not all equal or treated equally here in the United States. In short, living in Spanish Harlem and catching sight of the great divergence one can see here and feel at that boundary line on 97th Street taught me to cast aside the notion or myth of a classless U.S. society. There is an institutionalized divide between the wealthy and the poor or near poor in this country, and I saw it clearly in that spot on 97th Street in Park Isle. It is why from an early age I questioned one of America's brashest boasts, that is, that we have no class system. It's true that our country disallows hereditary titles of nobility and recognizes the sovereignty of the people, but a land of equity ours has never been. Our social class divisions are wide and cut deep. I saw that, experienced that, and learned that in Spanish Harlem. While there in Spanish Harlem, I also learned to tune out America's euphoric hymn to work and to reject the tendency to blame people for their economic hardship. These are two other troubles and beliefs and traditions that we U.S. Americans have often adhered to with respect to economic status and economic suffering. First, we assume that anyone can attain prosperity through work, and then we deduce that the failure to do so points to a fall from righteousness or to some character flaw rather than to a malfunctioning in our political and economic systems. Consequently, we end up blaming people living in poverty or near poverty for their suffering, deeming those excluded from the proceeds of prosperity as lazy, fundamentally weak, given to vice, or as inherently flawed in some or another way. But during my time as a resident of Spanish Harlem, I noticed that oftentimes work doesn't work. I remember the repeated cases of my fellow neighbors, churchgoers, and even family members who worked, worked, and worked for most of their lives, clocking in five, oftentimes six, occasionally even seven days a week at a job or two jobs as it happens. Yet for all of their effort, they never could quite get very far from where they started. They never could quite break away and move a comfortable distance from poverty or from near poverty. And on the basis of my experience in the neighborhood and with the people of the neighborhood, I can say for sure that the problem in this case wasn't one of laziness, dependency, inadequacy, or bad choices. The people in my neighborhood struggled mostly because their jobs shared three unhappy traits. They paid low wages, offered little or no benefits, and led nowhere. They struggled mostly because their labor was appropriated for the benefit of others. They struggled mostly because they were confined to poorly paid work. They struggled in numerous cases because they were denied access to income generating labor altogether. They struggle on the whole because the political economy of the industrial empire that lured them to these parts with hopes of opportunity, I'm talking about my Puerto Rican community, that, that, that lured them to these parts with hopes of, of opportunity, access to paid work, an adequate material standard of living, and quite, and hopefully, right, meaningful social progress failed them. What they came to instead was a mess of low incomes made up of low incomes, insufficient health care coverage, unemployment, layoffs, inferior public schools, distressed housing, underserved and therefore decaying in unsafe neighborhoods, a lack of resources, limited social mobility and political power, and more generally, a life of struggle. To add insult to injury, they got to live right next to an affluent and high opportunity neighborhood in the Upper East Side of Manhattan so they can see each and every day that the reputed American dream is only for some rather than for everyone. All this and more I saw and learned in and by way of Spanish Harlem. From my own point of view, two things ended up converging here. Struggle and drastic inequality. The conditions of struggle were evident in the physical characteristics of my neighborhood in Spanish Harlem and in the day-to-day lives of its residents. The drastic inequality of wealth, opportunity, and dwelling places, resources, and living conditions that transpires regularly in regions of the U.S. could be seen and is still plainly seen there. Now, both images remain engraved in my body and soul, in my heart and mind. 
These mental images engendered a literary emphasis in time. They are the main reason why I have given prominence to the topic of economic inequality in my writings and in my teaching additionally. Bearing the impression of these place-based experiences and lessons in my heart and soul, I have chosen to bring attention to the issues pertaining to political economy in class in hopes of raising awareness of the injustices of material inequality and in the hope that in doing so, more and more people will be persuaded to speak out to and grapple with the dilemmas of income, wealth, power, and assets inequality as well. Now bear with me. I am almost to the end here. I know all too well that the disadvantage of material inequality is compounded for people oppressed by racism, ethnocentrism, sexism, and other forms of discrimination. Therefore, I think it is important to keep track of the different status inequalities lurking in our midst, standing by at the ready to interrogate the institutionalized patterns, structures, and policies that produce and sustain them with the hope of defending identities, ending cultural domination, and winning recognition where necessary. But as I see it, we must beware not to limit the grammar of our political claims making to what may be called the cultural politics of identity and recognition, restricting our discursive activism to injustices that are traceable to culture and consequence. And this is the story that I've been telling now for more than 20 years. Now, as I bring this in the direction of a conclusion, I want to reiterate that the story here pertains to the power of place. I've shared an example from my personal story to shine light on the cognitive weight and on the epistemic sway of places, to highlight, in other words, the impact that places can have on our thoughts, our beliefs about the world, and on our knowledge claims. To highlight, therefore, the likelihood of their impact being ensconced in our intellectual projects and compositions, in the case of us academics, and or in the many other kinds of works we produce in our lives, and this despite the probability of us being in the habit of disregarding the matters, dynamics, and traces of place. Now, I started with a question that was posed to me, and so I'm gonna end by posing a set of questions to us as we leave this place. Having started my lecture with, with a question, I want to end here with the suggestion that we leave this place reflecting on the following questions or curiosities. What discoveries might we chance upon if we were to ask ourselves such questions as, what is the true providence of my thinking? In what place or places does my thinking take place? What has been the role of place or places on my beliefs about the world, on my ways of knowing the world? This one is not up there, but I'm going to include it. Is it possible that I have somehow internalized or absorbed the physicality and the materiality of the places in which I have dwelled into my self-perception and into my work and my ways of approaching or doing things? Is it possible that the experiences I have had in and with a place have shaped not only my ways of thinking but also my ways of feeling, of processing, and of being in the world? What is the correlation between the region of my upbringing or the places in which I have lived and the character of my ministry, my writing, my career, or vocational choice even. I hope it is becoming clear that these are not only interesting, but also meaningful and worthwhile and potentially revelatory questions. Even though our responses to them will vary, some of us may find deep and obvious, but perhaps also surprising connection between the region of our upbringing or our places of dwelling and the character of our thinking, writing, and ways of being. For others, the connections may seem less momentous or obvious. Either way, I feel confident that if we reflected on the matter more regularly and more observantly, we discover that the places from which we come echo through our subconscious and inform not only our understandings of thought and belief, but also our identities and activities some way or another. 
we discover, I am fairly certain, that the places in which we dwell and through which we move contribute something to our cognitive processes, identities, beliefs, hopes, and demeanors. In either case, the discovery should lead to an important conclusion, that places are impassive or ornamental backdrops for personal and social life. Places aren't mere settings for the human story. They are actors in life and agents of life with effective and life-shaping power. Power influencing what we know and what we say about the world. Places are one of the primary factors of our story, if we recognize them in this light. I thank you for your time and attention this evening, and God bless. Thank you, Professor Valentin, for a wonderful presentation. You've given us a lot to think about. And I'm sure folks have questions, so we have time for some Q&A. If you could just raise your hand if you have a question, and one of our GAs will bring the microphone to you. Hi. I've actually got two, but I'll try and make them brief. One is a question about authenticity. So when you speak about um, being from Spanish Harlem, can it be possible for someone who is not born in Spanish Harlem to be of Spanish Harlem? Or do you have to be born there, raised there, be Boricua, something like that? The other question I have is about people who were rejected by their places. Mm -hmm. And what happens, how do you conceive of people who have left or fled where they came from because some aspect of their identity was unacceptable. Yeah. Thank you for those two great questions. My, my talk, of course, my whole spiel here was based mostly looking at the positive connections to, to place, right? Our sense of place in a more positive way. But there, is, there are other, right, senses of place um, that need to be accounted for. It's, it's not all glorious and it's not, you know. Um, what I will say is that even in, in, in such cases um, is that we're still marked by those places, right? And, um, and in, in some cases, the, the wounds of those places will continue to inform us for better or for worse. Um, and Sometimes it is important to leave one place and make one's way to another place. Either, either way, we will always be emplaced and shaped by those places one way or another. Right? Now, to the question of authenticity, I think it's, it's a great one um, and uh, a complicated one, right? Because I think that there is something to be said for um, belongingness uh, in connection to, to corporal ex experience, right? Um, and certainly my talk was giving a lot to that, right? But there are other ways, I think, in which one, there could be belonging too, and maybe what we need to do is to distinguish types of belongings, right? Um, there might be uh, ways in which we, so I've, I'll give one example, right? Right, right next door to East Harlem, right? um, Central Harlem, we have was known as Black Harlem. How, how many um, black people around the world feel, in a sense, connected to Black Harlem, the mecca of black life in the US? And even if they have not lived there, they might say something about, there's a certain O to that place because of what it represents. Um, culturally, right, um, um, and, and, and in other sorts of ways. So I, I would think that the, the question of authenticity, we need to make distinctions about different levels, perhaps, of belongingness and, 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 and accounting for that difference. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on the way cities, especially, uh, broadly speaking, and places like Spanish Harlem function as sites of sacrifice? That is, for the city to prosper and thrive, sacrifices are made, Blood is literally shed that lead to the flourishing of some and the erasure of others. Hmm. Yeah. Wow, that is 
that is a uh, that is deep. That is deep, and I'm gonna have to really think about that as uh, you know as I go forth. Um, yeah, I mean, um, and, and even even here, I think that there are you know different kinds of sacrifices. Um, one particularly comes to mind for some reason is is um, in in the fight against forms of gentrification. Um, some people are taking on a certain kind of sacrifice, of saying we're going we're going to stay. <laughs> Regardless, right of what, of what the implications of that may be, either for you know um, disinvestment in the in the community because uh, in the neighborhood because of trying to push people out, um, disinvestment patterns sometimes is one way to, to push things out, or the, uh, sometimes a high cost of living, right um, in, in connection to, and so some, some I'm, I'm have in mind here, and this is probably not getting to what the question is, is, is um, but that there are. Folk who are, who are making sacrifices in their lives to fight against certain social processes, you know, in, in our time. But, um, but I'll have to think about some of the different forms of sacrifices that maybe, you know, are connected to, to, to life in, in, in different kinds of, kinds of places. And I think I always, when it comes to sacrifice and the, and the talk of sacrificial, um, I always like to say, well, who's sacrificing and who's not? And is the sacrifice self-chosen, or is the self or is the sacrifice imposed? Um, and I think that, to me, that you know, that's that's something that I always want to consider. Hello, Kayla August, first-time caller, long-time fan. Um, I actually have been. This is wonderful. Thank you so much. What I'm sitting with is I'm from New Orleans, and um, also an economically disparate city in a lot of ways, but the beauty of me um, getting to watch as a kid these very economically different communities come together during Mardi Gras and be one, mm -hmm. and seeing like what that showed me about the kingdom of God, that like in those moments when we're in celebration, we are not, we are one. And my question to you is living in Spanish Harlem, we got to see some of the um, economic um, uh, problems that were happening that were not being addressed but were there any gifts theologically of living in that space that you got to see uniquely from that lens? I just want to know. Oh, absolutely. But even this, I'm pointing as, as a gift, right? Yeah, even, yes, even, even that as a gift, is, it creates a certain sensibility, right? Um, um, so I even consider that a, a gift. But there are many, there are many gifts, I think. Um, it, and I think that, I think we're, and you've pointed it, I think, well, I think what New Orleans would have the same thing, that places that, that that suffer um, sufferings that are imposed by different sort of things find their ways of celebrating life in spite of that, right? And so I know that in 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 in, in, in Spanish Harlem, uh, celebraciones were you know hugely important, right? Um, and so whether it is, I I don't think that it is, for instance, a a just a sheer coincidence that uh, the Puerto Rican Day Parade, which is the, law, the biggest uh, parade in New, in New York City, in that big city, um, begins the day before with a, with a festival in Spanish Harlem, right? And so a lot of people that go back, they go to New York City to celebrate, you know, this, this Puerto Rican Day Parade. That picture, by the way, of J Lo or Mark Anthony, that was that was on the Puerto, Puerto Rican Day Parade. But the, the, to me, what's important is that the day before that, there's this huge fiesta. Right in Spanish Harlem, right, and so it it, it began there, um, but and so many things of, of 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 life from what I remember too. There's a certain certain things in the in the neighborhood. Like um, I remember um, we, the ice ice cones, right? Here at the, the ice cones, we call them piraguas, right? Um, they were very colorful, right? There, there was a certain you know, the, and and it, it would. You have la, la fresa, you know. You had the, you know, all the different flavorings. But there was a sense, there was a, there was a smile by in which things were, were given to you, right? That was, it was, you know, this. 
I'm, I'm having to make a, scrape my way through life, but this piragua is going to taste the best. You know what I mean? And, and you're going to absolutely love it, and it's, it's going to be given to you with, a, with a, you know, a smile on the face. Unfortunately, piraguas are hardly seen there anymore, um, but you can still see it in, in, in many of the, uh, you know, the, the, the cuchifritos are still there, which are the, the, the fried food kind of like establishments. There is something to be said, I think, that, that there's this, people might, might be struggling in all sorts of different ways, but there is, there is beauty in life, you know what I mean? There is, there is gratitude in life, and we're going to share that. And so one of the gifts that I, that I get, it's, some people call me smiley <laughs> in different places. I walk around with a smile. I have a feeling that's a gift from Spanish Harlem. Smile in the midst of it all. Smile of it. Yeah. We have an online question. In section 84 of Laudato Si, Pope Francis writes, the history of our friendship with God is always linked to particular places which take on an intensely personal meaning. We remember places and revisiting those memories does us much good. In this approach, how do you understand our friendship with God, especially in places that have been affected by disadvantage? Mm, yeah, that's uh, another good, good one. I would say that our encounter with God always happens in and through place. And here I'm reminded, one of my favorite theologians is Paul, happens to be Paul Tillich. And his way of thinking about God as he was, was trying to shift us into other ways of thinking about God that, don't, that didn't fall into certain boxes, right? You know, uh, human-like human boxes or anything like that. So he was like, what? God? God is the ground of being. Um, well, if that's the case, you know, that, that, you know, then that means that the ground of being comes through us to the very grounds in which we, we dwell and walk through, right? Um, so there is, there is something that I think that God encounters us and touches us. There is this actual touch, right, by way of, of the fabric of the places in which, in which we live. Uh, Likewise, and I think every other theme, I think, that uh, we, especially those of us who work in systematic theology and constructive theology, I think there's a way of connecting each of those themes linked, right, um, into, you know, the very fabric of land, uh, the natural environment, but as also the built environment, right, the built environment. I would notice that in the, in, as I get more and more into this literature, more, I think, more work has been done in terms of, of our environmental, um, our envi you know, our, our, our environmental, um, yeah, place, right? But element land, and also the built environment. I think there has received some attention, but I don't think as much attention as those. Um, um, yeah. So more, more to think about those sorts of ways, but I would like to ground every, uh, every theological concept I think could be clearly connected to, to the very grounds in, in which we walk through and live through. Yeah. Thank you, Professor, for your just amazing lecture. Um, my question is, um, how would you encourage, I loved your reflection questions at the end. As we reflect on our past and, our, and place, how would you encourage reflecting on place of origin when that place has either cultureless or negative connotations? I can think of my own past being homeschooled, rural New York, alone a lot in my room. You know, I went to church was the only time I saw people, and it was a fundamentalist Calvinist Baptist pastor yelling at me. You know that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's a real thing, you know, mm -hmm. and. I, I, I didn't grow up with culture. I didn't grow up with exposure and to new ideas, new people, new whatever. Um, and so how would you encourage reflection on, you know, I'm, I'm in theology school now, I'm, I'm passionate about so many things, but as I reflect on your lecture and on origin, it's almost an, a, it's a sobering emotion. So how would you encourage reflection on, on uh, past of origin? Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for asking that, that question. I mean, I, I think two things are certainly to note again is that 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 um as you as you noted, I mean there there are elements of there's a sense in which place gives 
and place takers, right? And I think we need to be account for that, right? There are many things that I, that I can say, how I see the world. Spanish Harlem has contributed nicely, but I'm sure there's things about the world that I don't see because of my being shaped by Spanish Harlem, right? So I think that, I think that that's, that's a reality of the life that we have to, right? Um, so acceptance, right? Um, um, going back to Tillich, he was teaching us that one way to think about grace is accept, 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 one, accept ourselves. And so accept ourselves in the, in, in the totality that we are, um, but also accepting our limitations, right? And so, but another thing that, so I would encourage, in other words, accepting all that comes with place. And, and sorting through that and doing that hard work. But another thing that I would encourage is to, to know that places, I've, I've been speaking about places more in connection to like regions and towns and neighborhoods, things like that. But places come in many different ways. So, I mean, uh, and perhaps the place that, that is a place of blessing is of a different scale within that very neighborhood, right? Our home could be, is a place. It's, it's a material location that we invest with meaning. More than that, sometimes it could be your very, a corner of a room, that could be your place. That could be the, your, your place of redemption, right? And, and grace and salvation. So I think to, to think about the possibility that, that places are, are manifold and come in different scales. And sometimes even in these places in which we might be wanting to distance ourselves, there are, Places within the place. You see what I'm trying to say? That we can gravitate and embrace. Yeah. Thanks so much for this. Um, the question I have is wondering if you've kind of thought at all, kind of in terms of the reception through scripture out of the way that much of that place is erased. So that when the disciples walk from one place to another, we don't know whether it was uphill or downhill or how easy it was to get from one place to the next and in fact it doesn't matter much to us whether it was a city or a farmland we just read it all universalized as if it was generic and maybe you go and visit sometime and see the sea of galilee but we've received that text so much as thought and so little as spot yeah. And I wonder if there's any reflections you have on that kind of erasure that happens through universalization. Yeah, no, and I, I thank you first of all for noting it, right? Um, yeah, I think here is this, um, I've learned from people like, who worked in biblical interpretation, someone like Elizabeth Shu, Sophia Renza, and things like that, to be attentive to um, what is said, what is, you know, I mean, even what is not said, right? But these little moments, like for instance, her, her, her book, But She Said, right? That, that, that little, sometimes we read over certain things and we're like, wait, you know, that, you know, those three words, that's where, you know, a lot of meaning is there. But sometimes I think also there's, there's textures of place and environment and locales in the text that we just read, you know what I mean, don't, don't pay attention to. But they're there, right? And sometimes the, the, the writer, the storyteller, was giving us detail you know, about, about, about the place. And in some, in some cases, you know, some decent detail, right? And so every once in a while, so one of the things that I've been doing is, thank you for, is, is doing the exercise of becoming a, a, a more, how would I say, place conscious reader. And know, noting how, how, you know, to enjoy the place of the text, right? That sometimes we, 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 we gloss over. And so one of the things I've been doing is actually going back and reading some of the, you know, the, the stories in, in, in both in the Hebrew scriptures as well as the Christian scriptures and capturing these little moments in which like, huh, it's very interesting that the writer or writers here in the midst of this story that they're telling found some importance in mentioning that about the town 
or that they were leaving the town or entering the town, and sometimes giving a little bit of description, right, of, of the town, just a little bit. And I'm like, whoa, that, you know, so I think that there's, there's, there's stuff there um, that I think we just need to, um, how would you say, give more, um, more space to, you know what I mean? More, more space and, and reflection to and, and appreciate, right? I think that there's something about these texts that, that um, come alive with more, more color and texture when we do consider the place in which the story occurs. Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah. I think more, yeah, more place-informed reading is one that I think we can, br we can bring. So I think that there's something here for everyone. You know, there's, a, there's a way in which biblical studies could be you know, I mean, done in a more you know, place-informed way. Um, looking into the places of the past, as well as the place in which you engage with the text. How do, you know? How how is how are those different place worlds and even imagined places? How those can inform us as well. Yeah. I think the Book of Revelation is you know it's imagining places, and sometimes it's not even like it's, you know, it's it's an imagined place, and yet that could be you know shaping. Yeah. So thanks. I'm so grateful that you are here and that we got to uh, listen to your words. And so it crossed my mind, and this is a good segue, that this lecture is taking place in a certain place, not Babson or Bentley, right, but a school for ministers, and that we gather in the name of a person who's called not Jesus of Jericho, which, by the way, was a rich place, but Jesus of Nazareth, so Jesus was a person of place, the very person right. that we're here for. So I'm just wondering if you have an ask for this gathering of people who are in one way or form or another ministers who will go to our places and live out our call to promote equality and justice. Thank you. Oh my goodness. You, I should just let that, I just, <laughs> I should just let, let those, those words right there. I don't need to add anything, anything to them. I think that that invitation speaks you know, re really, really, really well. Um, yeah, I think the calling is, 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 is manifold. I think maybe one way that what I've been doing here is uh, I, I grew up, uh, I'm a PK, I mean, a pastor's kid. My preacher's kids, and so in my, and certainly in my my church tradition, my ecclesial tradition, that we had these altar calls, right? There is a sense in which I'm placing a call. It's not an altar call, but it is a call to place. <laughs> but it is also a call to to be sensitive um, to the struggles of of place, and that could you know that could be many different ways. To struggles of the that the communities that live in places, maybe you know that could mean. You know, being a champion for you know anti-racism in some cases, right? Anti-sexism and anti-patriarchy in some in others. It could be anti-gentrification in, in in some cases, right? Um, and so the invitation might be many, but I think it's us to kind of plug in and 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 see what that calling um, is for us. It is, it is a call to place, and a call maybe to get back into place. Uh, and and to and to deal with you know I mean what whatever challenges those places are calling us to deal with, and, and the calling is for everyone whether whether you, you know you're a minister whether you're thinking of humanitarian leadership, you know whether you, whether you're thinking of religious education or whether you're thinking of academics, I think there's a sense in which there's a call here for everyone. Yeah. But thank you for naming that. Thank you, and thank you for coming. By the way. Um, bring, connecting me back to a place that means so much to me. Right before the lecture, um, she was telling me about Andover New Theological School and how, what, what, what was the year that you, um, 2016, that she had gra you had graduated? Uh, and uh, it brought back <laughs> to mind a place that was, you know, means so much to me and shaped me in so many different ways. 15 years of my life. So yeah, that place is, so thank you for bringing me back to that place in so many ways. And with authenticity. <laughs> we have another online question. Your experience of Spanish Harlem focused on economic disparities. As you talk with others, 
What are some of the ways Spanish Harlem formed their experience? I'm thinking of women, of artists, etc. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, I could speak as about so many, but I'm going to uh, mention just a few um, that didn't come up here. But um, uh, Spanish Harlem, East Harlem happens to be the home place for, for, um, for many styles of music that began there. Some of us uh, actually, and it was a bit of a rivalry between Miami and you know, New York City, but I think that there's more evidence to point to the fact that uh, salsa um, as a musical genre began in Spanish Harlem. Um, and um, I would also point out here that, um, and, and that of course, you know, that was a gift to the community across you know, our differences, whether, you know, gender, sexual orientation, what have you. Um, yeah, um, cultural differences. There was a sense in which that gift, that gifted everyone that part, part, partook of the, of the neighborhood. Another thing that I want to point out to is how murals were so important for this neighborhood. And it happens to be a struggle right now because of gentrifying, gentrification forces wanting to do away with these, these murals that for a long time just it's, it's, it was, it spoke, right? Um, many, many people's sense of, of, of beauty and art comes from that, not from, not from MoMA <laughs> that you have to you know, pay to enter, uh, wait, you know, for, for many of us, including for me, my, my first sense of art and, and many others, right? in the community was sometimes walking, opening up the door to, to your house and, and seeing a, a mural right across the street or walking just a few blocks and use, and sometimes some of these murals were ch changing, right, and had different kind of messages. Um, some of them were, were challenging or some of them were more empowering and uplifting. Um, but I think that also there's a sense in which um, everyone in, in, in the community or associated with the community, whether living in it or not, can say that they, um, that they in some way or another have been touched by the artistry of the place, whether through murals, through, through musical genres that have begun there and, and many. Oh, the food, by the way. Is, I think it's because of, because of it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neighborhood fast changing, by the way. It's, it's, it's fast changing and some of us are are fearing you know, what, whether histories or will be forgotten, you know, when in the transitioning from what, from one style, one neighborhood to another. Um, but for a long time, um, I could tell you that I was coming close to my neighborhood because of the smell, right? And there was one that was not pleasant, <laughs> and then the other one was pleasant. We used to have a place called La Marqueta that was, I think, went from 116th Street to 109th or 110th, was it, Eli? So six or seven blocks in Park Avenue underneath the train. Um, and the smells, oh, it was at a fish was, was sold. And so you can sometimes smell it from far away. Ugh, you know, that, the smell of La Marqueta. But then there was these other kind of glorious smells. And I don't know if some of you sometimes maybe you've been away from home and, and maybe you're taking a drive, right? Um, I know in Puerto Rico, I knew I was getting close to where my, my grandparents would live in Arecibo when I could smell pineapple because they live in, right next to pineapple fields. And I can close my eyes and I could be making my way and we're nearing Arecibo. Well, there were times that I can close my eyes or people can close their eyes and know that they were ne nearing Spanish Harlem because of the wonderful smell of the food. The bacalaitos, you know what I mean? The, the alcapurrias that were sold there, you know what I mean? All this, all. So I think that there were many different ways in which people could be impacted by that kind of place. Okay, I think we have time for one last question. It's also an online question. Uh, do you think about the role of language limits or enhancements in place? Uh, the person says, I work with a tribe who seems to have flexibility and subtleness in how places are named. 
Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, I haven't, I have to admit, I haven't thought about that connection too much yet. Um, but I will, I will, I will travel with it now as, as, as I continue to think through. Um, yeah, my turning to place, even though the question was posed to me back then, it, 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 it um, is a more recent turning, I have to admit. For a long time, um, I, even that question that was asked me by Ada Maria Sassidias, it remained unanswered, right? Um, and I, all I got a chance to, in my interaction with her is to ask, Ada, what, what were you asking? <laughs> And let me just get at least a question right. And so, okay, now I got the question right. But then it just sat for a long time, I have to admit, right? And different things pushed, pulled me in different directions, right? The challenges of the academy and, and where I was working at and, uh, and having to get tenure in those places and then push you to write certain kinds of stuff, right? So that question for, you know, just was there as a, as a seed, but that I never watered. And so what I'm trying to say by this, it was only, I think, uh, five or six years ago that I decided, well, let's water that. <laughs> let's go back and do something with that. And so I've been, since that time, I would say in the last five or six years, is that I've been really studying things connection. But this is all to say that there's still realms of this discussion that are new to me and that I need to still discover. And I think that one in connection to language is one that I still need to think about a little bit further. All right, well, we'll have to bring you back when you've discovered what there that connection go. is. Let's give him a round of applause, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>